Um, so without further ado, let me uh, dive into our first session. And as we uh, turn to these, these academic talks, I'm gonna ask you uh, to go to your mobile device and go to uh, the website pigeonhole.at. Um, you will be asked to enter a passcode, an event passcode. Please enter in Haas Culture as it's written up there. And uh, then you'll be asked to select a session title. So we're about to do Plenary Research Session 1 Q&A. So you can click on that. And this will give you a, a chance to then enter in questions for the speakers as they are talking. Um, if you're uh, thinking about a question that cuts across the talks as a general question for all the presenters, just uh, begin your question with the, the preface of all in parentheses. And if it's a question that's targeted to a specific presenter, just put that person's name um, before you write your question. And then you'll, ha you'll be able to see everyone's questions on this platform. And if you see a question that you're also interested in, you can upvote it. So when we do the uh, Q&A session, we can then focus on questions that are of greatest shared interest uh, for everyone. Any questions about Pigeonhole before we, before we proceed? Okay. All right, so our first uh, plenary research session has four uh, speakers. Uh, we're gonna begin with a talk by uh, Oshkazan Kochak, uh, then Klaus Weber, Christy Lockwood, and then Michelle Gelfand. Again, uh, please submit questions as they come up through Pigeonhole, and uh, we'll then uh, have a time at the end. So we're gonna hold questions till the Q&A at the end, and then we'll get a chance to talk to all of the four presenters together. So with that, Oshkazan, if you could please come on up. Good morning, everybody. Is this working? Is this working? Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I want to start by thanking the organizers for putting together a great program. I'm very excited to be here in the presence of great scholars and leaders who've been thinking carefully about culture and observing organizational cultures. And I'm very happy to get a chance to present my work on this. I'm going to be talking about part of an ongoing collaborative effort with Panish Pranam on organizational codes. And specifically, I'm going to talk about communication codes, which we think are important for understanding organizational cultures. I'm going to start by illustrating what I mean by a communication code. Oops, this is missing a slide. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was going to show a picture of a car flashing, it's, oh, there it is. Um, so when I moved from Istanbul to Atlanta a little over two and a half years ago, I noticed pretty quickly that a car flashing its lights at you means something else in Atlanta than it does in Istanbul. In Istanbul, if you see a car flashing its lights at you repeatedly, it means I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to slow down. Don't come into my way. <laughs> Beware. Whereas in Atlanta, you often see stopped cars flashing their headlights at you repeatedly to say, I know it's my right of way, but I want you to go first. Now, obviously, these are very different meanings associated with the same signal. And this is common for communication codes. They vary across groups because they are arbitrary. It doesn't matter what signal we associate with what meaning, as long as we all agree what that association is. And we see this in experiments as well. Here are some images that Massimo Warglian and I used in a series of experiments where we had participants in the lab talk about the set of tangrams. And um, they came up in each group with a label. They pretty reliably came up with a label for each of the images. One of these images on this page was called a sumo wrestler. Can you guess which one it was? If you tell me, I'm going to point at them. A sumo wrestler. Middle bottom. Middle bottom? No, that was not the one. <laughs> this one? Yes. And the same image was called disabled man by a different group though. And this one at the very top left was called by different groups variably as Superman, Michael Jackson, <laughs> arrow pointing left, the Nepalese flag, a pine tree, and a Christmas tree. So these codes 
are different, vary across organizational groups. And this is important because as Ira pointed out a long time ago, organizational codes are rigid. Once you establish them, they are difficult to change. Once you learn, acquiring a code is a fixed investment, and given our scarce resources, we don't want to go around learning many different codes. And so reliably across organizations and across subgroups, subunits within organizations, you have different communication codes emerge. When people need to communicate across organizational boundaries then, it is common to have dissimilar codes and clashes and conflict and failures due to miscommunication due to these reasons, sometimes with very grave consequences. In his book, Friendly Fire, Snook relates the accident in 1994 when two uh, US Air Force fighters um, shot down two US Army Black Hawk helicopters over the no-flight zone in Iraq. Um, and he related this accident, going over many di different documents, and related the reasons for this accident to three particular differences in codes. The term aircraft was understood by the Air Force to include helicopters, but by Army pilots to exclude helicopters. The two groups had different did not agree on the acronyms concerning no-flight zones. They did not agree about the rules for electronic exchanges. And all this remained latent. They were not aware of these until the accident happened. And dissimilarities across codes are not just found in the military, of course. They are all over the place. Um, and there are some very well-documented instances in civil aviation, in healthcare, in law, and across the board. So what we are interested in in this project is trying to understand what kinds of differences exist across communication codes. Do they reliably make it harder to converge on a common code? And can organizations do anything to facilitate convergence on a common code? And we're going to do this in this project. We do this in this project with a computational model, trying to to trying to model communication codes as mappings of labels to stimuli. So in this case, the label of a tree to our concept of a tree. And we're going to repre we represent these through lexical matrices that each person has in their mind, right, a code. And dissimilarities across codes will be reflected in dissimilarities in these matrices that map labels to stimuli. And there are a number of ways in which codes can differ when agents from different organizations or different linguistic communities meet. You might have instances where people have developed their codes in the same task environment using the same set of labels, but they have different associations of labels to stimuli. Sometimes this is done purposefully, as in the example of secret languages. So if you do a web search for the Culper code, for instance, you're going to find a code that was used in the Civil War by attaching 763 words, uh, words, some of which are names of people and places, to numbers. So they used it, obviously, to be able to write codes that the enemy could not decipher. But these are quite limited in instance. More often, we might ca find cases where people have developed different codes in the same task environment. De Vecchi, in his study of a merger in France of two airline companies, finds that one airline's crew members use the word trolley to refer to this object, which in the US would be called, I think, an in-flight food cart. Um, and the members of the other company, which were also French, called it a commodity. So two distinct labels for the same stimulus, right? Uh, co communication codes that include the same set of stimuli because they originate in the same task environment of cabin service in avi civil aviation, but using different labels. In other instances, we might find that people have developed their codes in different task environments 
But by using the same set of labels, mostly from the same natural language, such as English, that they are speaking. Beth Bechke has this great example from a semiconductor manufacturing firm where she observed that design engineers and assemblers would use the word slide to refer to different objects. And Gibbons and Henderson give, their, give this example of the match the market when two firms merging and promising their employees, both of them, each of them promising their employees that they would match the market to determine bonuses, realize down the line that they did not mean the same thing about when it came to matching the market. And here's this cute example from a preschool in China where the children were asked to bring a fish to observe to class. <laughs> Many of them brought a pet fish, but this little boy brought a dead carp. <laughs> we might find instances also where people develop different organizational, different linguistic codes, different communication codes, use it, referring to very different stimuli with different labels. So this is called a dodecahedron, which refers to the shape. We don't know what it was called back when it was used in the first to fifth century uh, in Northern Europe. We don't know what this object was. We don't even know what domain it belonged to. And we don't know what it was called. So the Roman soldiers, presumably, who used this, according to one theory, and we, belong into different thought worlds. So we're interested in these kinds of code clashes occurring, and then what is, how do they impact the likelihood or the speed at which we develop a common code, a convergent common code, when we are living through these code clashes. Now, when people with different codes come to interact and try to communicate, they face two big challenges. And they face these challenges even if they are motivated to be able to communicate, even if they are motivated to converge on a common code. The first big challenge is that it is not easy to figure out what the joint referent is. So what is it that we mean by commitment? What is it that we mean by toasty when I define wine as toasty, right? In the sense of sensory perceptions, it's difficult to be in somebody's mind, obviously. Right? And organizations predictably meet with, these, with this challenge due to specialization, due to geographic dispersion. So this is a problem. Some organizations have found ways to deal with this. In the example that Beth Bechke wrote about, for instance, the design engineer and the assembler met and looked at the object that they were referring to as a slide, and that tangible description helps them resolve their differences. Others have written about boundary objects, which are similar things. McDuffie has this very nice example of quality engineers at GM. Is that five minutes remaining? Okay. Um, so, of, the, of, of uh, quality engineers coming up with a visual glossary of the different kinds of paint defects that might, they might encounter, coming up with these names like boil, boil's eye bump, with pictures associated with them so that a visual reference can be established. The second big challenge to code convergence is that learning to communicate requires some or both to converge and to be willing to adapt their own codes. Or, and organizations solve this by having rules around deference, um, authority or status differences that, require, that then uh, get some people to adjust their codes more than others. They might also have offline training orientation sessions. So we're going to we model this process through what's called signaling uh, games, and we have one agent observing a stimulus, finding the label that they associate with that stimulus, communicating that to the other agent, the receiver then inferring a stimulus based on the sender's label, and we see if they are the same. If they are the same, these label stimulus associations are reinforced. If not, they are weakened. We model hierarchy 
or asymmetric learning here by having one agent learn faster than the other, and we model tangible reference by making it possible for the receiver to see what the stimulus was if there is a mismatch. Um, there's previous work using such models in um, evolutionary biology, linguistics, and so forth. Uh, the difference here is that we model contextual differences, and we're interested in the dynamics of convergence rather than just the end state. So we're looking at communication success, how likely it is that we match. Uh, we're looking at the similarity of the code that emerges as a process, how similar are our codes. And we're also interested in the crispness of the emergent code. A crisp code is not going to include many synonyms or homonyms, which reliably also lead to failures in communication. So what we find is that stimulus clashes the case with the slide and the fish and the matching the market examples are reliably, reliably do worse in terms of producing similar codes that are crisp and that produce good matches. They do the worst. Um, and I'm not going to have time to get into why. If you're interested, then we can talk about the mechanisms that's driving that. Um, and so, this indicates that some of the hunches that I've been hearing about subcultures in organizations being worse than difficulty of communicating across organizations, this bears this out, that if you have developed your codes in different task environments, and if you happen to use the same label for different stimuli, then you have a much harder time eventually converging on a common code. This is by the way, also consistent with research that we found in um, aviation where they are concerned with teaching air traffic controllers and pilots to talk to one another. And there are examples of native speakers having a harder time to unlearn their previous code and learn a new standard aviation code compared to foreigners who are just learning a standard aviation code and don't have the colloquial English to conflict with their new code. Um, looking at whether asymmetric learning helps, we find that it helps slightly in these situations of stimulus conflict, but it's actually detrimental when you only have label conflict. So that's the case of the trolley and the commodity. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer interactions are going to be preferable to hierarchical interactions in the case of cross-cultural collaborations that cut across organizational context, such as buyer-supply relationships or vertical integration. Establishing a joint reference, these tangible reference definitely helps across the board, but it helps the least when you have stimulus clashes. When you have stimulus clashes, your best bet is to add new labels and to disambiguate. So the engineer and the assembler to come together and say, agree, we're going to call this slide one and this slide two, for instance. Right? You need to be adding new labels to make the language more crisp. So to summarize, um, we expect the greatest difficulties in code convergence if prior codes were generated in different task environments. So this could be different occupational groups, um, different functions, different countries, different markets. Communication challenges in post-merger integration, buyer-supplier relationships, and R&D alliances may actually be less severe than those that you find in cross-cultural collaboration, within cross-functional collaboration within a firm. And in multinational organizations using the same language, you might have the same labels, use of the same labels actually hide some differences that exist in the code. So it is going to be important to disambiguate even when there's apparent understanding because you are using the same labels. Thank you very much. say the same. Thank you very much for organizing uh, a fantastic um, conference, and I'm very glad I can be part of it. Um, I will talk about a...
shows up there, but not on here. There we go. Sorry, it was just a delay. Um, I'm going to talk about a um, different aspect of um, culture, and um, I've become very interested in um, a culture that is not um, sort of declarative in form, that is um, not ex articulated in language and is very uh, sort of easy to communicate or that's very visual or that's very um, object sort of bound. And uh, one aspect of that is culture that is um, uh, affective in nature. Um, we can think of um, uh, this as ways to experience the world in, a, in an emotional way, in an affective way, uh, the kind of moods that people share or not share, um, the sort of expressions that you would use um, uh, in order to respond to external stimuli. Uh, you can show that you're angry, that you're happy. You can always have a positive face and a positive persona, or you can show your agitation and anger. And um, different contexts reward um, different um, affective displays and different affective um, experiences. Should I use this? All right. um, the um, specific... Um, uh, context I want to look at um, in this um, study, uh, which is with um, Kartik um, Bajpai, who is the first author, is a, a former doctoral student who is now at uh, AM Lyon, um, is on uh, display rules, um, the kind of rules for expressing emotions in, in the workplace um, and uh, the role they play in how people interact with each other and the choices they make in who to interact with and in what uh, capacity. Um, uh, in, with a different audience, I would spend a lot of time on, on my first sort of premise. Um, um, but basically, one um, reason why we care about culture is because it is a source of um, social solidarity and order. Um, this applies to organizations as well as other contexts. Um, uh, units, um, groups um, uh, that share a culture um, feel a sense of commonality, um, and they know how to interact with each other. Um, that's why we uh, think of a... Uh, a shared culture in an organization is something that's valuable uh, because we know what to do, how to interact. Um, um, I think the affective uh, dimension of culture, the way we uh, experience and share emotions with each other, uh, is particularly important for social solidarity in a larger sense. Um, and the, uh, the reason is that affective experience is oftentimes referred to uh, what I would re refer to as sort of deep culture, uh, ideas of um, uh, the overall ethos of an organization, um, the sort of ideals and identities that we share, um, and that sort of pattern our emotional responses to uh, things that we experience. Um, uh, so people oftentimes get angry, uh, not just because something went wrong in a small sense, but um, because that thing that went wrong uh, sort of has implications for much broader assumptions about uh, who we are, who we want to be, uh, what is valuable, what is right, and what is wrong. Um, and those things uh, create affective responses. Um, um, and so the alignment of affect in organizations is particularly important because they really uh, connect um, our uh, interactions and our experiences to those um, uh, deeper dimensions that are often unarticulated, um, however very important for uh, having a sense of commonality. Um, the second premise of, um, of our work is that um, interaction, um, interpersonal, one-on-one uh, -on -one or group interaction is very central. So we can have um, a very abstract idea of belonging and identity uh, with an organization, uh, but ultimately where those things come to life is in interacting with each other. That's how we calibrate, that's how we actually can experience directly um, the, the sort of um, commonality or the disconnects that we have. Um, so, for example, in, the, in the, you know, the previous presentation, we might have different codes, um, but we might not be aware of it until we start talking to each other and realize that, we're, that we actually don't share them. Right? So that there is an interactional dynamic that makes the things that are abstract that we as researchers can assess um, real and experienced by the people that actually engage in them. Um, and so cultural norms about emotion are the same. Uh, they, so there's a general point here, and then I think it applies to emotion, and there's, uh, there's some work on, on emotions in, um, uh, in interactions. Um, uh, Randy Collins' work on interaction ritual chains, uh, Lawless' work on, uh, on exchange um, interactions and, and the role of emotions in that. 
Um, so my main uh, sort of um, premise or the, the main sort of um, master hypothesis is that some um, affective alignment in interactions, interpersonal interactions with each other, enhances social solidarity, engagement, and perception of group membership. Um, and this is simply that if we have um, an interaction at work uh, where we feel uh, emotionally aligned, uh, where we feel emotionally reinforced, um, gives us a sense that, yes, this is actually my group. This is my organization. Uh, this is my community. Um, and it's not something that we deliberately and articulately say, right? It's not like we say, oh, yeah, we're all part of one family. And those uh, messages can be very uh, very shallow, very hollow, if they're not supported by an, by an affective sense that, yes, we are actually uh, in the same group, uh, we share the same thing. Um, so the, um, what we do here is uh, looking at interaction networks um, um, in terms of distributed interactions between many different people, and so you can see how that would matter for uh, solidarity in terms of the extensiveness of the, the network, the regularity. Um, because the group, um, in our sense, is, is um, first and foremost um, a, uh, an assembly of different interaction situations. Um, um, and that's uh, in contrast to what we oftentimes do in organizational research, where we say there's an organizational culture, we say that it is there. Uh, the way that people experience those things um, are in much smaller interac interaction networks that they um, uh, operate in a day-to-day in -day basis. And that's where they sort of develop the sense of, uh, yes, I'm part of the group, um, I support my, my co-workers, for example. Um, and then there's obviously an emphasis on the affective versus uh, cognitive linguistic alignments um, uh, that we have um, uh, much more uh, studies and, and arguably better methods. All right. <clears throat> One of the, um, the key ideas um, that we're trying to develop um, is um, uh, the idea of how we actually code emotional displays in those interactions. Um, uh, so we have, um, you know, we have the same sort of communication framework where we have um, uh, ways of understanding emotional signals. Um, um, if I sort of smile, jump up and down, you might think I'm... Um, I'm happy, I'm um, mentally sort of challenged, um, um, I have a, a twitch or I'm just sort of um, really upsetting because I break norms, right? So we can sort of uh, code those things in different ways. Um, uh, however, the displays of emotion serve as affective cues to affirming a shared identity. Uh, can we actually agree on what we do? Can we affirm each other's um, emotions and sort of show compassion, for example, um, or uh, if we both express anger at the same time, uh, it signals that um, we share the same affective reaction to what's going on around us, which indicates to us that we share a broader idea of who we are, what our values are, and what we want to be. Um, those emotional displays are, are sort of culturally conditioned, and I'm going to focus on the external display. Um, I do think there's a parallel argument about the internalized experience as well. Um, however, I have a hard time uh, methodologically getting at it, so I'm going to focus on the, on the display in the interaction. Um, and we use the concept of emotional competence, which is um, basically an evaluation of um, emotional displays in an interaction uh, according to role and situation-based expectations. Um, I've done some sort of more theoretical conceptual work on that. Uh, I think the key point here is that um, we don't expect everyone to um, share the same emotional expression across all situations and, uh, and relationships. Um, so if I interact with my um, uh, supervisor at work, um, you know, I expect, um, or he or she might expect some degree of deference and politeness um, when I interact with um, someone that, um, I don't know, if I'm a basketball coach, um, curious um, uh, what he thinks about it, and I, I yell at my players, um, I can do that because I'm the coach, right? So, um, but we're someone else that wouldn't be expected. So the, the display roles are, uh, the rules are, are sort of tied to particular situations and particular roles that we play in the interaction. And the competence is really knowing those rules, knowing how to express emotion appropriately at the right time. Um, this is a little bit akin to broader ideas of cultural competence that, for example, cultural consensus modeling is used, uh, where I could assign a competence score to each member of an organization in terms of how well the rules are understood and expressed. Um, I think there's, uh, there's sort of two um, 
uh, ways in which to think about competence. One, I think, is a very generalized expectations of synchronization uh, that we expect some emotional displays to be roughly aligned. We want to have a shared mood in interactions. Um, if we have a real disconnect um, and I'm super happy and um, uh, you super sad, um, it doesn't, doesn't exactly build a, a sense of solidarity. Um, I think Randy Collins' work sort of um, really uh, uh, points to that, uh, that importance of synchronization as one form of competence. Um, and then the other one is expectations of appropriateness, um, the role and situation-based ones. Uh, now, role and situation, you could also think of as simply breaking down to uh, shared group norms in a smaller group setting. Um, so if we are a team at an or in an organization that we work together, we might have norms when we interact as a group versus in the larger organization. Um, so competence is important to accomplish that, that sort of sense of solidarity. Um, the specific setting that we look at, um, and um, I think it's a, a particularly interesting one, is the situation of crisis. Um, a crisis situation that I define here as a situation where uh, the identity and the uh, sort of the core understanding of the group or the organization is challenged. Um, so it's not just that uh, someone made a mistake or there's been a slip. Um, there's a very fundamental challenge that um, makes us ask, um, well, who are we? Are we the right um, type of organization? Um, and uh, in those sort of uh, crisis situation, uh, there is that threat to the group ethos and the ideal image that we have, and so we have to respond to it. Um, now, you might um, expect um, a growth in solidarity um, in those situations, so we rally the troops. Um, um, I think in reality what we often see is um, it poses a threat to solidarity um, because some people might question uh, the group membership and the group um, cohesion um, and might actually uh, split into subgroups um, unless there's a, there's a very uh, strong unifying force. Uh, so the baseline ex expectation that we make is that um, there's actually distancing from those perceived to be very proximate to the crisis. Um, so if we can put blame on someone for causing the crisis, everyone else can distance themselves from them uh, and preserve the group membership um, by basically excluding some, but not others. So social exclusion is a way to, to preserve uh, the, what holds us together. Um, there's a second process um, by those that are affected by, by the crisis that are sort of uh, more, more close to it, and that is, um, in, in a so colloquial term, you could sort of think of it as turtling up, um, so that we only interact with our trusted um, uh, most um, strong ties, and we refrain from interacting with everyone else, and it's sort of a loss of generalized trust in the group that happens as a, res as a result of the crisis. Um, affective views are especially important for processing this kind of social information in, in times of crisis. Um, and so we have two hypotheses. One is about social distancing and one is about withdrawal. Um, and the prediction would be that um, uh, members with uh, greater emotional competence experience less distancing by others. Uh, so others do not sort of hold back um, uh, interaction. Um, and they also uh, withdraw less. Um, the setting that we look at is um, a um, hedge fund, a smallish hedge fund, about 200 employees um, based on the East Coast. Um, uh, the culture, as you might imagine, is a very masculine one. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the data that we use, it comes from instant messages and emails. There's a lot of uh, things I couldn't show on TV, language-wise. Um, it's a very sort of macho type of culture that uses a lot of emotional expressions of a particular type uh, to sort of create a sense of solidarity. Uh, the crisis event is a pretty straightforward and a pretty unambiguous one. The hedge fund was actually raided by the SEC for insider trading, and some people were arrested and let out of the building. Um, threatened both the identity and the viability of the organization. Uh, luckily, this happened halfway through the observation period, um, luckily for us. Um, and so what we have is a, a, a corpus of instant messages and uh, email communications. It's, uh, it's the complete communication network of the uh, organization. Um, and these are pre and post the events. Uh, so we can look at how people communicated, who they communicated with before and after. Uh, we use the instant messenger um, uh, data to construct a measure of emotional competence, primarily because in this workplace, um, instant messenger is used for uh, more social sort of um, uh, chatter. Um, we cleaned um, that, cor that corpus to really focus on that um, aspect, so we took out some 
uh, instant messages about financial trades that um, people might exchange about sort of company announcements and so on. Um, and then we sort of, um, you know, convert a lot of the slang and sort of special characters and um, emoticons and everything else they use into uh, text so we can analyze it. Uh, we then use the uh, uh, lexicon of emotional expression. It's the, is created by the National Research Council of Canada using sort of crowdsourcing methods. It's very comprehensive. Uh, it looks at eight emotional categories, and then we, yep, um, we basically uh, create a, a similarity measure of ingoing, ingoing versus outgoing messages. So how much do I align with my interaction partners? Uh, we use the email data to construct a measure of uh, distance from the crisis in a more sort of work-based interaction sense. Um, email is used for formal communications here for things that are on record. Um, and so we use basically a, a, a communication network um, based on who communicated with whom to identify how, how, how distant people are from the people that actually got, got arrested. And then we have a number of um, uh, controls, um, and we use a three-week pre- and post-event um, uh, comparison design. Uh, here's the findings. I have to show the obligatory regression table. Uh, we used a, a pretty straightforward um, OLS regression. Um, and what we find is an interaction between the proximity, uh, so this is how close you are in the interaction network um, to the people that actually got busted, um, with the emotional competence, how well your emotional expression um, aligns with the people that you, that you communicate with. Um, and I'm going to show you the uh, interaction term as a plot. Um, basically, that people with higher emotional competence um, that are better at aligning emotional displays with their interaction partners uh, experience less of a distancing, so people avoid them less, um, and they also withdraw less from others. Um, so we use in-degree, out-degree as a rough measure for this. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things we can do and want to do to refine this, but that's the basic idea. Um, the effect is weaker the further away from the crisis uh, you are. Uh, so the emotional competence really kicks in if you're at risk of being um, sort of blamed or, or sort of withdrawing. Um, implications, I think um, the, 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 it sort of affirms our sort of assertion that uh, we have to pay attention to affective dimensions of culture much more. Um, and that emotional competence can meaningfully explain social distancing and withdrawal, which I think are very central processes, both in organizations, um, but also in, in societies. So how do we exclude people? How do we um, uh, uh, sort of bring them in? Um, and that we sort of need to pay more attention to the, the emotional underpinning of network dynamics um, um, as sort of um, being very central to network formation and sort of reconfiguration, restructurings. Um, I think there is a substantive contribution to organizational solidarity and crisis in terms of how people respond to, to crisis situations. And sort of managing emotional uh, displays in the interaction is obviously very critical, not just um, to make people feel less threatened, um, but also to reestablish a sense that um, they're part of the same um, organization um, and we don't have a disintegration of a... Um, of a fairly shared culture into um, fragments and, and sort of uh, conflicts. Thank you. Right, I think I'm waiting for my slides to come up from someone in the back. So um, while I'm waiting, I'll take this opportunity to say thanks to Jenny and Samir. Thanks to all of you. My slides are up now. So <laughs> when you enter the Liberty Hotel, you're immediately struck by the towering four-story atrium. If you're in the know, you may recall that the catwalks that encircle the space were once traversed by prison guards back before the former jail was condemned and became the luxury hotel that it is today. Across the lobby, you hear a jazz quartet playing, and you decide maybe you'll linger for a while. After all, as one informant put it, jazz is a way of saying you're classy without saying you're classy. It's a way for the organization and its patrons to signal symbolic value, or in other words, to send a signal of distinction and identity. But what do the vestiges of an old jail have to do with distinction and identity? Or jazz music or anything about a hotel lobby, for that matter. That's the phenomenological puzzle that got me interested in the ideas and the work that I want to share with you today. 
I wanted to, uh, to understand how organizations construct and convey symbolic value on the ground in interaction with audiences, in my case, in interaction with hotel guests. So to understand that, I looked at uh, the Freedom Hotel, as well as five other luxury hotels in the same collection, to develop a well-grounded well and thorough perspective on symbolic value and culture in commercial settings. Now, this is a qualitative inductive study, so I don't use theory to build and test hypotheses, but rather to sensitize me to constructs and dynamics of interest. And I use as my jumping off point the recognition that cultural resources are valuable for firms. I approach culture from a toolkit perspective as the set of stories, symbols, rituals, and worldviews that we use to construct meaning and address a variety of challenges. Now, within this body of work, research on cultural entrepreneurship has been particularly interested um, in how organizational actors use culture uh, to rally the support of uh, valued audiences um, and, and secure, their, uh, yeah, secure their support, gain their favor. Um, what research in this vein suggests is that organizations should make claims crafted as stories or rit uh, rituals or labels um, that increase the familiarity, the familiarity and coherence of the meanings they seek to have ascribed back to them. Um, and it suggests that by doing so, organizations can ensure that these meanings resonate with and will be used by um, these valued audiences. Some organizations, though, uh, send more implicit signals about themselves. These are organizations that seek to convey symbolic value, or in other words, the value of their products or experiences as symbols of customer distinction or social standing and identity. Now, uh, the, the importance of symbolic value, I think, is um, relatively clear um, in luxury settings, like the one that I'm looking at. But it's also become increasingly attended to by, by a variety of other types of organizations, including artisanal distillers, watchmakers, and even housewares producers. And this is becoming the case as consumers look for new ways to express distinction and identity through their consumption choices. For all of these types of organizations, overt claims or explicit displays threaten to debase them and their patrons. And so the strategies of clarity and ambiguity reduction that tend to be advanced by work in cultural entrepreneurship may be less effective for these, these firms. Uh, at the same time, though, subtlety can also be problematic because it can invite confusion and misinterpretation, particularly among audiences that might not share a common cultural vocabulary with that firm. Um, and because a high level of subtlety um, can invite consumer involvement in uh, meaning construction, it can also allow those consumers to take interpretation in unanticipated or undesired directions. So in sum, the research suggests on the one hand the importance of subtlety for conveying symbolic value, and on the other, the likely ineffectiveness of these types of strategies, suggesting the need for a deeper um, and more thorough understanding of the processes and mechanisms by which symbolic value is conveyed by firms. So that's what I examine in this study. I ask broadly, how do organizations use culture to successfully communicate symbolic value to customers? And in particular, I'm interested in understanding what this process of cultural entrepreneurship looks like when subtlety is more important. Really, how do organizations create a match between the meanings they seek to claim and those that are likely to be used by audiences? Uh, so to uh, understand this, I conducted uh, an inductive qualitative case study of six luxury hotels in one large luxury brand, which I call the Grand Group, a pseudonym. My data ranges from the year 2000 to 2015, consists of interviews, observations, um, and our archival data. I analyzed this first with in-depth content analysis. I used that as a springboard uh, for creating case studies of each of the six hotels. And then I looked within and across, within and across each of these ho uh, hotel cases to identify strategies that were common to successful cases and that were missing in unsuccessful ones. What my findings uh, revealed was that across the six hotels, there was a concern with changing ideas of identity and distinction among customers. My informants told me, you know, there, there's been this idea for many generations that it was more you were born into wealth, and it was with wealth and with price that distinction and identity were conveyed. But suddenly, that didn't resonate with our guests anymore. And so that was the starting point for rethinking the importance of symbolic value in luxury settings like this one, and for considering how to effectively convey that to guests. This was a challenge, though, uh, because the hotels realized that symbolic value wasn't something that they could explicitly claim. They said it has to be given to us uh, by guests. 
Now, despite the challenge that this presented, five of the six hotels that I examined were successful in conveying symbolic value to customers, as measured by guest reviews, comments, and their continuance, the hotel's continuance with the grand group. While one hotel was less successful and eventually exited the group to be positioned in a lower industry tier. What was common to the successful hotels was the provision and use of what I call cultural scaffolding, which aided in the construction of the experience and evaluation of symbolic value in the hotels. So for successful hotels, in other words, rather than constructing meaning for guests, they provided a minimal sensible structure that allowed guests to construct meanings for themselves. Now this cons consisted of a couple of key components. Uh, cultural scaffolding used linguistic resources to outfit guests with cultural acumen or skills needed for meaning construction. It used minimal cues to prompt interpretation by guests. And then it connected linguistic and material resources and interactions between employees and guests that enriched, tailored, um, and refined emergent interpretations to foster perceptions of, of symbolic value in the firms. Um, I'll talk about each of these components in a bit more depth now, drawing from uh, drawing examples examples from two successful cases, um, that of the freedom uh, and the speakeasy, uh, to kind of illustrate. So uh, cultural scaffolding first focused on outfitting guests to see themselves as what the organizations called collectors and explorers. In other words, to familiarize customers with the symbols and practices, uh, skills and knowledge that were associated with a certain level of luxury, with conveying distinction and identity in this context, right? We're trying to educate guests on that. So to that end, while in the early 2000s, language was really concrete and informational, by around 2010, stories had become more experiential, existential, um, focused on delivering a narrative expressive of an archetypal guest. So modeling the cultural variety that marks social elites, uh, these stories moved with ease uh, between a discussion of the sublime and the mundane and even comical. For instance, language, excuse me, uh, travel, they said, was about seeing things differently so that you don't end up missing the world around you. At the same time, you need a passport and a bathing suit because not a lot of places I've realized approve of skinny dipping. Language like this modeled this sort of cultural variety. It expanded what um, explorers and collectors could encompass, providing multiple points of connection for potential guests rather than narrowing possible interpretations. This cultural variety was complemented with a level of cultural depth, fostered by um, focusing in on concrete expressions of, um, uh, of uh, this, cultural, uh, uh, this, this cultural depth in these organizations. So I'll give you an example here. Um, at the Speakeasy, they, st they spoke of Span Stanford White, the original architect of the jazz club that became the hotel. His design principles em embodied the American Renaissance, a striking floor-to-ceiling 18th century stone fireplace, Originally a gift from him acts as the centerpiece for the hotel's restaurant. So making reference to these um, discrete material manifestations of the hotel's history, uh, language alerted guests to potential cues that they might uh, encounter in their stay, sort of tuning their ears to symbols and artifacts of consequence in the hotels. So in sum, with, with these efforts at cultural outfitting, the organizations, uh, the successful organizations, uh, alerted potential guests to the type of patron they could become through affiliation with the hotel um, and equipped them to have a status and identity affirmative experience. These, this language helped to spread the word, tell stories, getting guests en get guests engaged in the idea that this is here to help you create and write your own story around these destinations. That's what we're here for. Uh, now, Language could uh, still be kind of theoretical. Um, and so successful hotels found ways of getting those, those stories to translate more concretely into guest stays in, in ways that reliably allowed for guest expression of distinction through consumption. Uh, what I expected to, to find when I started to examine this in the hotels was really concrete uh, manifestations of this language. But I found quite the opposite. Um, what informants told me was, you know, the first thing we were able to do was to take away a lot of standards, strip away a lot of things that said you'd have to do this and um, do that in terms of the material cues used in the hotels. And, and they began to use materials much more minimally and suggestively. So to show you a bit around what that looks like, um, I'll talk a bit about the Freedom Hotel. So at the Freedom, I spoke with an informant who said, initially, we used materials too heavily, right? We recreated a local baseball stadium. They made the outdoor 
outdoor space into this kind of hot dog cookout thing. They had flat screen TVs everywhere. They were trying to make it into that point of interest. And that cultural reproduction, that heavy handedness was a mistake. Now, when the hotel used those same kinds of cues related to baseball more minimally and more suggestively, for instance, in a hotel suite where you see um, the chairs are sort of suggestive of a catcher's mitt, for instance, um, they were better received and more talked about by guests. These efforts were complemented um, by some efforts to sort of pair cues that seemed um, discontinuous or contradictory to one another, right? So with the um, Speakeasy Hotel, they paired these um, sleek, sort of advanced bathroom technologies alongside cues that harken back to, say, the 50s and 60s. Uh, and what informants told me was, you know, this is on purpose. It's the combination of the two cues that allows them to complement one another, that creates surprises and attracts guests' attention, and prompts them to engage in interpretive efforts here. Uh, so taken together, these efforts at minimal cueing kind of serve to paint a picture, give guests an idea of the history or other details of the hotel, help them feel in tune with coming here, and that was a part of the uh, experience of symbolic value. It allowed guests to make use of that cultural acumen, that cultural depth and breadth that they had been outfitted with, um, and use that in the context of their stays as they encountered these cues. Still, mistakes were not uncommon, and so uh, successful hotels found ways um, to, to sort of revise and refine emergent guest interpretations. Now, what they were looking for wasn't to foster a singular interpretation per se, but rather to align the meanings the hotels sought to claim with what resonated personally with guests. So the conversation became more angled to, what do you want? What are your values as a guest? And this was accomplished through these interactive efforts that unfolded between guests and employees. Um, these efforts made use of the minimal cues that had been used um, previously. So employees said, you know, if we find somebody looking at them, we'll start talking about it. It's a great way to sort to start that conversation, begin that process at enrichment. And by engaging with employees, guests were sort of, um, excuse me, by engaging with guests, employees were sort of able to glean, um, you know, what, what uh, guests were beginning to understand, the meanings that were emerging around the things they were um, encountering, so that they could provide provide some feedback, maybe uh, add a, li a little additional color and detail, maybe direct those efforts in, in a, a bit of a different direction. Um, these efforts seemed to be um, really natural and sort of um, unscripted, but in truth they paralleled, they used talking points that hewed closely to uh, the linguistic resources that had been imparted with cultural outfitting. Right? So this was a process um, that was really planned for, it was part of the service culture, and at the same time we like to do everything we can to sort of personalize the experience for guests. So guests were really integral to this interactive enrichment as well. Informants told me you have your brand identity, you can't deviate from that, but it's about customizing the experience so that it's going to make sense for the guests. If it doesn't resonate with them, we haven't done anything right. So with interactive enrichment, the hotels accomplished sort of a twofold goals. Um, they had this means for sort of subtle cultural policing that refined and narrowed the possible interpretations the guests might make about the hotels. And at the same time, it allowed them to tailor those meanings to guests' own histories, their personal predilections to ensure that they resonated with and were used ultimately by guests. So cultural scaffolding ended up being really important to uh, uh, organizations' ability to convey symbolic value because it allowed them to put guests at the center of meaning construction. By holding culture lightly, so to speak, the organizations used language to equip guests with cultural depth and breadth, um, expressive of eliteness in the sense that it mirrored both the omnivorousness and the expertise that elites tend to possess. Uh, with minimal cues, the organizations prompted interpretation and allowed for the expression by guests of distinction and identity in the context of their stays. And with interactive enrichment between guests and employees, the organizations had a means for tailoring and refining emergent interpretations to resonate not just with the stories that, guests, that the hotel sought to advance, but with the personal histories and predilections that guests brought to their stays too. Ultimately, this ensured the experience of distinction and identity or of symbolic value, in other words, in the context of guest stays and the ascription of those meanings back to the hotels. Now, I know I'm short on time, but I'll just take 30 seconds to, um, I think, give you a quick preview of what I think this contributes to management work. 
My research reveals how organizations convey symbolic value to customers by furnishing what I call cultural scaffolding that enables and guides meaning construction, suggesting that the ideal place is sort of the middle ground between this ambiguity reduction that work on cultural entrepreneurship suggests is important and this subtlety that's discussed in consumer uh, behavior literature. It advances the view of cultural entrepreneurship as an interactive, dynamic, and ongoing process rather, one that's rather than one that's focused at organizational nascence and on legitimate Animation. And it extends research on status and value creation by showing how distinction doesn't function just as an objective market signal, um, but is also culturally and claimed and constructed in use on the ground. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker, but thanks for your attention. Okie doke. Welcome, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you to the organizers. I think Jenny put me in the morning session because she knows I'll talk slower in the morning, <laughs> right? Um, so um, I think many of us um, are uh, here interested, oops, let me go back, uh, in the questions of, ooh, what happened here? There we go. <laughs> of um, innovation and culture in this conference at different levels of analysis. And so today I'm going to talk about my interest in trying to understand national level innovation. And the question is really what makes nations innovative? And this is of course a critical question uh, in the current era of globalization as nations compete in a variety of different spheres from biotech, AI, energy, among many other domains. And we know a lot about innovation at the small group and organizational level of analysis. And the question here for us is how can we understand national levels um, in cultural norms and how they feed into different innovation related capabilities. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'll just go ahead and define innovation uh, as processes, outcomes, and products of attempts to develop and also introduce new and improved ways of doing things. And herein really I highlights the paradox or the contradiction when it comes to innovation because it involves really two very separate, perhaps competing types of processes. It involves idea generation and creativity, but also it involves fundamentally implementation. And March called this exploitation and exploration, later something that um, Mike Toshin also talks quite a bit, really involving fundamentally different modes of learning and, and perspectives that engage separate, um, separate different approaches. So for example, Exploration involves trying to maximize variation. It involves risk-taking, experimentation, and it involves also flexibility. But exploitation involves very fundamentally different types of behaviors. It involves refinement of existing products. It involves production uh, and scaling up. It involves efficiency, and it also involves, well, as we know, implementation. Um, and so, we can see here in his quote, exploitation and of interesting ideas often thrives on commitment more than thoughtfulness, narrowness more than depth, breadth, and cohesiveness more than openness. So you can see kind of the tension that's involved in trying to really uh, do both exploration and exploitation at the same time. And what I want to talk about is national level differences in cultural norms that might actually feed into these two separate processes and present some preliminary data to show some proof of concept for some of the ideas. And so social norms are these unwritten uh, rules for behavior that sometimes become formalized, and we follow them constantly. We're following them right now. Of course, if I start singing and dancing and breaking out some bourbon, Jenny knows that's possible, uh, that you kind of say maybe you should think more careful about who you invite to this conference, right? We follow them constantly. We drive on the right or left side of the road, depending on where we live. Uh, we don't walk into restaurants and grab food off of people's plates and chew with their mouths wide open and burp very loudly, although that sounds like my New York family dinner. Uh, we won't walk into elevators and face backwards. I encourage you to do that sometimes because it's quite interesting to see how people look at you. And also, we don't have things like sex in public settings. We reserve this for private settings. We don't see people having sex on public benches at Berkeley uh, or in buses. Um, we've developed norms to help prevent these kinds of situations. And in that respect, norms provide a very critical function in terms of coordination and predictability. They're the glue that keep us together. 
But what I've been focused on for, for many years is how this glue is stronger in some contexts than others. And I want to kind of get into some of the predictions for how this affects innovation. So tight cultures are uh, cultures that have strict norms and punishments for deviance. They enforce a narrow range of behavior. And loose cultures afford a much wider range of behavior. They're much more permissive. And this is a distinction we started to look at some years ago at the national level. And while all nations have tight and loose elements, some cultures in our data, like Japan and Singapore, to some extent Austria, Germany, Switzerland, tend to veer tighter. Other cultures like the Netherlands, New Zealand, Brazil, and the US to some extent, tend to veer looser. And what I was interested in this particular project is A, looking at how this is different from existing cultural dimensions. Is it just old wine and new bottles? It turns out not to be the case. It's related to, but distinct from things like collectivism and power distance, and it's totally independent of GDP at the national level. And I was also interested in why these differences evolve um, across cultures. And one of the candidates that we were betting some of NSF's money on for this project had to do with collective threat. And the logic is actually pretty simple. Cultures that have a lot of natural disasters, Mother Nature's fury, or a lot of human-related threat um, require stronger norms in order to coordinate to survive. So think about places like Japan that have chronic natural disasters, a lot of conflict, or Singapore that Lee Kuan Yew identified as a place that really has a lot of vulnerability, require having stronger norms um, in order to coordinate. And that's what we found We're looking at data on food deprivation, on uh, pathogen prevalence, population density, natural disasters, and conflict over the last 100 years. Uh, this pattern also was found at the state level in terms of other related types of variables, food insecurity, storms, disease stress, and, and how rural states were where there's more of the gossip mill and the ability to monitor each other and prevent norm violations. And more recently in a paper, we've shown this in the ethnographic record, the same kind of logic applies to pre-industrial societies. We coded about 100 ethnographies um, and tried to look at the connection between the strength of norms in these con contexts with similar types of pressures and found some um, similar types of data. Um, one of the implications of this is that cultures need to prioritize different types of goals. And what we found over the years is that there's a very predictable trade-off of tight and loose for order versus openness. So, for example, tight cultures have much less crime and more security personnel um, that are watching people. As Ara Nori Zion would say, watched people are good people. Uh, also, they have greater uniformity in what people wear. In sending RAs around the world, we actually camped out in parking lots and coded the make and uh, color of cars. We could see that there's more uniformity in those kinds of things in car behavior. They also are actually less likely to park out of the lines. We had them measuring how much cars parked out of the lines, which I do quite a bit. And also, there's more synchrony in tight culture. So they have more synchronous um, clocks on city streets. If you can look at, we measured actually how much time was different on city clocks, they actually are off by milliseconds in tight cultures, whereas you're not totally sure what time it is in loose cultures. And there's also more stock price synchronicity in a recent paper in the Journal of Financial Economics, more buying and selling of stocks tightly coupled in tight cultures. And finally, there's much more self-control. In contexts where there's a lot of social control, where you have to actually behave yourself much more, then, and there's potential punishment, people monitor their impulses much more. So there's less debt, uh, there's less alcoholism, um, there's less obesity controlling for a variety of factors. So you can see that loose cultures kind of struggle with these issues, and tight cultures corner the market on openness. Um, and as I mentioned, this tight loose trade-off for loose cultures, this is something that they corner the market on is openness, and tight cultures struggle with openness. There's less culture superiority and a variety of data points. We just published this in PLOS One recently. There's more accepting of immigrants. There's more accepting of people stigmatized more generally. Uh, in the, the, one of the studies in this paper, I had uh, my students go around the world wearing fake facial warts or fake tattoos, or not fake tattoos, tattoos and nose rings, or they were wearing their normal face, whatever that means. Um, and they asked for help in city streets and also in other contexts. And there was no difference across cultures when people were asking for help when they just looked normal. But there was much more help given to people who were wearing these crazy facial warts and tattoos in looser cultures. And there's also greater openness to change in um, looser cultures. Um, we found this in some computational models. 
And I'll just say last but not least, more recently we've developed some new linguistic measures of tight loose that were just published in Nature Human Behavior where we can look at the changes across the last 200 years in the U.S. and see the exact implications for how changes affect this order openness trade-off. So as the U.S. has become more um, loose over the last 200 years, we see this great increases in creativity but at the sacrifice of order. These measures included things like debt, truancy, teening pregnancy, and so, and so forth. So we can see some longitudinal causal effects. Okay, so back to our question about the implications. I think you're probably on board now with the idea that looseness is probably connected with exploration, with its encouraging of deviation, ideation, and variation. Tightness should be more connected to exploitation indices at the national level, where we can see that the corner arm order might help with exploitation. But again, innovation combines both of these processes. So our major prediction was that actually, if we think about which nations are the most innovative, we'll see a curvilinear relationship with tight loose. That is to say that countries that are able to balance um, tight and loose elements in their culture should be more innovative on national indices that combine these kinds of indicators. Tighter cultures, or that veer very tight, should be having problems because they can't engage in the kind of creativity exploration and vice versa. Extraordinarily loose cultures might be able to really be creative but not really be able to implement them. So um, one example in a book called The Startup Nation uh, that was written about Israel really was very interesting. They talked a lot about how Israel is extraordinarily creative but it has a hard time scaling up. Whereas they compared it to Singapore, which is not as creative, but has a great benefit of being able to scale up. So we wanted to see whether we can test these ideas with various different data. And I'm just gonna give you kind of a, a big picture because I was just showing this fake data, but I have a couple of minutes left. Um, but basically we wanna look at some world value survey data that looks at the idea that tightness should be associated at the national level with more routine and manual tasks, whereas looseness should be connected with tasks that are more creative and intellectual. There's a lots of data across 10 years or so on this one question that I'll show you in a minute uh, that we can look at with multi-level modeling to see whether or not controlling for lots of factors we could see a connection of tight and loose with these indicators. Also we could see a, a look at entrepreneurship type measures in terms of development of new business activities. We also wanted to look at national level outputs, um, more uh, sort of data on startups, on scientific and technical outputs per capita, artists and humanities papers per capita as indicators of exploration, and also other connected variables on exploitation like manufacturing output, agriculture, and these industries combined. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you some of the data. This is, for example, a question that you would be asked in the World Value Survey, are the tasks that you work at work mostly manual or mostly intellectual? This is across many waves, thousands of people. Same question on, are the tasks you perform at work mostly routine or creative? Uh, and you can see in these models, this is controlling for time, this is looking at this in a multi-level context, that it's clear in our data that tighter cultures have less focus on intellectual tasks and routine tasks and the flip side for looser cultures. We see this also with other data from the Global Entrepreneurship Data Monitor, again, across many different, across multiple years and people. Uh, have you been involved in development of new activities uh, for your main employer, I'm ignoring my time card. Um, and we can see again with multi-level modeling, controlling for various factors that should be related to new business activities that again, you see more of this happening in looser cultures. In terms of national level outputs, uh, we can see also some proof of concept that number of startups per capita tends to decline as we increase tightness, controlling for things like GDP. We see that uh, scientific and technical publications are also, again, higher in looser cultures, much lower in tighter cultures, controlling for factors, arts and humanities papers per capita as, in as indication of exploration. On the flip side, you see that manufacturing value uh, as a percentage of GDP is also much higher in tighter cultures as is agricultural output requiring a lot of coordination and combining these kinds of industries as well. Okay, so the main last finding I wanna show you and just talk about some of the implications has to do with these global innovation indices. We rely here on the Global Innovation Index, the GII, uh, which captures in a lot of ways both exploration and exploitation. So you could see here that it involves knowledge creation but also impact and diffusion. It involves creative goods and services but also involves online creativity. And we looked at linear and nonlinear effects 
of this index. Uh, again, over time, there's multiple different years of this data. We want to see how robust it is. And what you see here is above and beyond any kind of linear effect, you see a, a very strong curvilinear pattern in terms of the countries that can balance both tight and loose elements having the highest level of innovation. Okay, so I have one more slide, so I won't be nagged. Uh, so some of the implications, I mean, this is just kind of new data that we're starting to explore at the national level. We want to start looking more at within culture variation as well as um, across units within the same organization. We also think it can help us to think about how to use norms and to negotiate norms in organizations in order to kind of shift the focus when a tight culture needs to be more exploration focused and when a loose culture needs to have uh, more exploitation. And so, for example, Tesla is a decent example, I think, hope there's no Tesla groupies out there, um, where there, it's really very strong on exploration, but clearly has some problems with exploitation in terms of production and scaling up. On the flip side, places like United, which should be tight, it's an airline, arguably are really good at exploitation and coordination, but sometimes get into trouble when they don't create and be flexible in certain circumstances that's caused them a lot of PR problems more recently. And so we're starting to develop some ideas related to this idea of how do you insert some structure into a loose culture? This is what we call structured looseness. And how do you insert some flexibility into a tight culture? We call flexible tightness. Uh, because if we want to try to capitalize on the benefits of exploration and exploitation, these systems need to negotiate the strength of norms in either of these directions. And this is just kind of a crazy slide with these things to wake you up, <laughs> that talk about drawing on a lot of Tushman's work, how might we actually do this? Um, and we're testing this now in the U.S. Navy. We just got a grant from the Navy. The Navy really is worried about being too tight. Uh, but they um, have so many rules and so many domains. And so we're starting to look at the kind of leadership characteristics that help um, shift an organization that is too tight, to loosen it, to get, engage in this flexible tightness. That in, might involve things like decentralizing, encouraging pushback and flexibility, allowing uh, individual agency. On the flip side, we need something very different when we're trying to tighten loose organizations that perhaps are failing on exploitation. So here we might think about this as how do you insert structure, centralizing, rule enforcement, setting benchmarks, encouraging reliability into those systems that we might call structured looseness. And so we have some new measures we're trying to implement in the field. I'm gonna have a shameless plug for Jenny's presentation coming later today where we're starting to develop new simulations of tight and loose organizations basing on looking glass um, simulations that Jenny's done in the past where we're now trying to look at this in a more controlled setting uh, so that we can um, look at more causal mechanisms. So I think that that's about it, and I'll hand it over to Shin. Thanks to all four of our presenters. If I could ask them all to come back up on the stage. And uh, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, and several of you have already been on Pigeonhole uh, posting questions. You can still do that now. Uh, or if you think of a question as we're talking, you can also just raise your hand and we'll have mic runners. Um, but the first question uh, we have is for uh, Oshkazan. Um, and the question is, um, well, I'm going to ask two related questions to you. Is code convergence a desirable normative outcome? And under what conditions would you say it is? Um, and um, the related one is, how would you apply your findings in a situation where there's a merger? Uh, what can be done to ease some of the issues around code convergence in that setting? So you can, uh, maybe you can kick us off. So convergent codes, that is codes that are similar across linguistic communities or subunits within an organization. Also, if they are crisp, that is not ambiguous, are going to produce communication success. So where the goal is communication success, yes, you do need a convergent code. But miscommunication can be productive, and there is a term, productive misunderstandings, in the literature. It is not very well elaborated, but Panish and I have been thinking about this at some length. Um, let me give you an example in how productive misunderstandings can arise from exploration that is spurred by misunderstanding. If I go to, into a seminar room, to listen to a seminar on NLP, thinking it's going to be about natural language processing, mm. but actually find out that it's about neuro-linguistic programming. 
and I'm afraid to step out embarrassed, I might actually learn something. So those kinds of exploration can be spurred by misunderstanding, which then convergent codes might prevent. But when the goal is communication success, yes, you do need a convergent code. Uh, the second question was about mergers. So in mergers, what uh, our simulations show, which uh, is in line with experimental work as well, is that through repeated interaction, you are going to be producing some convergence. But our simulations show that the degree of convergence you show is going to depend on the nature of the clash in the code in the first place. So if you have clashing labels, that is different labels associated with the same stimuli, you are going to do pretty well if you have peer-to-peer -peer interactions repeatedly. But if you introduce asymmetry into the relationship, that's going to hurt it. Um, in experiments, I can also say that where you have friends interacting, that is friends who already have some common ground, they do pretty well even in asymmetric situations. But strangers who don't have a common code about interactional norms do very poorly coming up with multilingual codes, so different codes clashing with each other, continuing to clash with each other rather than being able to produce a common code. When you have a stimulus clash situation, that is when people have developed their codes in different task environments, but using similar labels, then you would actually want to introduce new labels to be able to have crisper languages and not just introduce new labels, but also disambiguate with some purpose to uh, associate distinct labels with distinct stimuli. Terrific. Um, so the next question is actually a joint question to both Michelle and Oskajan, which is, um, in, do tight and loose cultures have correspondingly tight and loose codes? Whoa. <laughs> I think for collaboration. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would imagine that there's less variance permitted in terms of the code enactment um, in tighter cultures. Like, there's just more standardized nature of how do we actually implement this code. So you can get away with a lot more room for um, variation in the code. That would be one hypothesis. Right, um, so, so you would have less ambiguity about what to do in a particular situation, for instance. Yeah, that's right. I think that um, you know, in our studies of situational constraints, sort of Walter Michel notion of you know, how much permission is there for a wide range of behaviors. In a library, it's much more restricted. In a party, in here it's also restricted, by the way, <laughs> in this setting. Um, that you know, in other contexts, it's wider range, and it's okay to have ambiguity about what people are going to do. And, and it makes sense that there'll be less tolerance for ambiguity because when you have a lot of threat, you, you you need to coordinate quickly, and so having that ambiguity could be problematic. Right. Right. So there are there are these two important dimensions to consider, both the ambiguity and also the similarity, the extent of similarity we have, which goes back to the earlier conversation we had about subcultures. And so if you look at world survey, uh, world value survey, for instance, there are countries like India and Turkey which appear to have tight cultures, but are also very heterogeneous in the values that they advocate. So heterogeneous values combined with an in, intent to enforce those norms indicates probably some different subcultures existing, right? So that's a distinct, that's a different yeah. situation than having similar norms, but also ambiguity. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a really important distinction because we need to separate levels of analysis of the norms and the individual variation in attitudes and values. Uh, I think it's a mistake to measure tightness as uniformity in values. Um, in fact, you can have a lot of heterogeneity. As long as you're all agreeing with the norm, um, then that's where we get that sort of tightening. Um, and in fact, in very heterogeneous countries like Pakistan, there is very, there's high tightness. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting connections across. Can I ask a follow-on to because it, it's uh, uh, now that we're talking. Do you think that ambiguity and repertoire breadth are perfect substitutes? Because I see what you're talking about, this ambiguity that you know, we might have one code or we might have multiple meanings for it. I think what you're talking about is a narrow range of options to actually use. And I could see, no. hypothetically, I could have a very, very broad set of very, very crisp um, ways of doing things. Or I could have one norm that is very, very strong, but it's sort of flexibly sort of interpreted. And it, do you think of those as 
equally good or is one better than the other for what you're looking at? I mean, I think having a lot of breadth gives you that latitude and that makes it less predictable when you're having interactions mm. for people to be doing a lot of different things. So I think that um, it's, for coordination, it would not be good to have that mm. strategy um, because you want to be able to predict each other's behavior. And, I, mm. and the more latitude you have, the more that repertoire is broad, mm. the less predictability you'll have. Maybe it makes also sense to think about these in different domains of code. So if, you ha if I have moral codes, they can be very ambiguous in that I'm going to react to any negative transgression, say, with the same response, right? Tit, tit for both tat and toot and spat and whatever. So that's very ambiguous, but very consistent right. and very good for communicating that you were not happy with whatever right. was done. Yeah, we can all believe that we have that one moral code, right? Even right. Though we have some Whereas if the goal is to communicate about a specific technical design, say, yeah. then you do want more precision. Yeah. Um, so and I think it's important to separate those domains of moral code versus communication about technical issues versus you know, day-to-day -day behaviors about where you might have what kinds of clothes on and so forth, like military norms. Yeah. So, um, any other, we'll turn to the pigeonhole in just a second. Are there any other questions that have come up in the discussion so far that people want to raise their hand and ask? If not, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. When we're talking about convergent code, I'm curious how you're thinking about taking power dynamics into account so that underrepresented groups don't do all the code switching, which is what currently happens, <laughs> right? And I'm curious about like the potential for um, promoting like fluency between codes, for instance, so that there's more of a mutual code switching happening. Thoughts on that? Well, the computational models that I showed do indicate that asymmetry is not always beneficial. In fact, if you are suppressing some groups, some codes, and getting them to differ, it's not always beneficial. So for instance, in an acquisition setting, if you impose the acquirer's code on the acquired's code, um, depending on the kind of clash, in some situations you, have, you end up with a code, the emer it is convergent, but it is convergent in a not very good way in that the acquirer is not able to recognize the stimuli that the acquired <laughs> knew, but the acquirer didn't know in the first place. So you have the acquired party completely looking at the situation from their trainers, their acquiring partners, point of view, which is not a desirable situation. So there are definitely instances where you don't want those kinds of asymmetries. Um, yeah. Thanks. So the next question is for Klaus. Um, Klaus, the question for you is, um, how did you get buy-in from the hedge fund to provide the data? <laughs> um, to what extent did the employees know that you were uh, collecting these data? Uh -huh. And um, if they were aware, how did the company frame your research project uh -huh. to them? I see some data envy here. Uh, <laughs> so for full disclosure, the, the, uh, Brian acquired the data. Um, so I, I was involved in the study when we started to make sense of it. Um, so I, I try and relay the story um, to the best of my knowledge. Um, the data it was um, uh, basically given by the company. Um, email communications, these are all work email accounts and instant messenger accounts. They are technically the property of the company not the individuals, um, and they had already archived those, and they wanted to do a study on innovation and trading. Um, and so they, uh, the company made them available uh, in anonymized form. So some of the limitations that we have in analyzing it is that we, we have very, very little close to no information about the individuals. Uh, all we know is their organizational units um, and their gender and how many years they work there. Um, so there's a lot of things I would love to know that, that we simply don't have because we, we had to anonymize the data. Um, and then um, I think it was a personal contact slash um, that might be a financial advantage if we can optimize our coordination in the communication network. Um, we might be able to be better in trading um, and that might give us financial benefits. So the, the leadership of the company thought that there was potentially a business case for it. Um, they did obviously not 
sort of care about the, the, the raid as much. So they, they were looking at the trading activity, uh, but they gave Brian the entire data set. Um, and uh, for, to the best of my knowledge, this did not require individual consent um, by the employees since we didn't collect data directly from them. Um, so lucky, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is for Christy, which is, uh, to what extent does cultural scaffolding require that the customers in question are themselves culturally competent and homogeneous? That's a great question. Um, you know, the intent, at least on the organization side, is that it requires a relatively low level of cultural competence and homogeneity on the customer side, right? The idea is we do have customers, you know, we have business travelers, we have leisure travelers, we have US based, we have international, um, all of whom are sort of coming from different backgrounds. And what we want to do is bring them on board with this idea of what it means to be a luxury hotel guest, essentially. We want to educate them on. On, on what that means and how they might enact that role, um, and then allow them to enact that role in the context of their stays. Um, now, in practice, this doesn't always happen, and that's why I think you know this mechanism of interactive enrichment that I was discussing, you know, where um, hotel guests and employees kind of work closely together in refining and sort of tailoring emergent meanings becomes really important um, because we don't, you know, we the hotels don't always um, kind of succeed in bringing everyone on board with with this idea. And and frankly, for for some guests, um, this doesn't matter all that much, right? For a business traveler, you kind of want to get in, you want to get out, that sort of thing. Um, but for an increasing number of guests, the hotels are finding um, this is important. And so, yeah, again, the idea um, is that there doesn't need to be a high level of competence or homogeneity because that's really what the cultural scaffolding is intended to foster, right? In a flexible way, in a subtle way, but in a relatively potent one. Um, and and I, and I think. I think that's true. For the most part, there doesn't need to be an existing level of competence or homogeneity, um, because generally this, this seems to be working for the hotels. Next question is from Michelle. The question is, um, to what extent can cultures be designed, created, that help organizations escape or avoid the exploration exploitation trade-off? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I, I, you know, I studied negotiation in my other life, and I rarely combined the two uh, and now that's exactly what we're trying to do is say, you know, norms are something that are negotiable. Um, and um, the question is, um, they're so, or the issue is they're omnipresent, but they're invisible. And I think just like with code switching, the, the issue is how do we kind of make this part of the discussions in organizations? How do we directly say, let's talk about this? Um, this is kind of a cheesy example, but I, I talk a lot about it in the household. Um, in our house, you know, what domains have to be tight and what domains have to be loose. And of course, I have to technically negotiate that with my spouse, um, <laughs> who veers tight. He's a lawyer and he's more accountable than I am. Uh, and we have very different preferences, um, as do the kids. And I'm just giving this as an example that is more of a micro kind of culture that you can actually think about the domains in which we have to have norms and organize and then explicitly negotiate whether they need to be tight or loose and communicate that and get buy-in from, in this case, the kids. Um, and I think in our recent project with the Navy, we're trying to develop measures where we can explicitly say, here are all the domains in which you have to have norms, including appearance um, and time and work tasks and lots of different domains. We have about 12 domains uh, that we think will comprise some kind of nice profile. The military is an example of a place that normatizes most things. And the logic is that it's because if you buy into wearing certain types of socks or having certain types of haircuts, then you will subscribe to the larger, more important norms. Uh, and we're trying to kind of help them to be more flexible in certain domains that maybe they can loosen up in. So yeah, I think it's negotiable. I think it requires having a list, depending on the context of the domains of norms that we need to um, uh, to be aware of and then, and then explicitly negotiate, have the leaders that can do that. So I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, all of these things uh, that you're talking about require a certain level of awareness of what underpins these cultures. And I think particularly, thank you, the, the, uh, the note about language, at some point you have to realize that you're not talking about the same thing. And so I'm curious if any of, any of you have anything to say about the processes by which people become aware 
either of the fundamental norms or of, of conflict in norm or expectation. So one thing that makes it very hard to realize you're not talking about the same thing is if you don't see what you're talking about. So a company with a mission, say, to uh, enrich community health by connecting people to real food. I think this is Sweet Green's mission statement. Um, to have a common understanding around this and build a culture around this, to coordinate around this, you need to make sure that people understand, have a, the same understanding about real food and commitment and community. Um, you may be able to, so real food might be easy to establish, right? You put salads and whatever, and you say, you know, here we can trace where these come from, and you know, you can uh, recognize the shape. It's not like chicken nuggets, which <laughs> could be in any shape or form and um, still be uh, eligible for being called chicken nuggets. So some of them are going to be easy to establish, where others might be very difficult, where you don't see a clear joint reference. We find that that makes a big difference. Um, but it also makes a difference whether you have this from the beginning of the interaction or whether you introduce it after you've realized you've miscommunicated. So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Great question for Klaus, um, which is, uh, given that the affective norms you're talking about develop over time, mm -hmm. and given that you had access to longitudinal mm -hmm. data, how did you think about modeling the emergence yeah. of those norms mm -hmm. in your data? Um, I mean, the, the data is longitudinal, but not that longitudinal. So like many organizations, <laughs> those norms are sort of passed yeah. on, and, and so people get socialized into them. Um, so the, I think what we can do is assess the stability of the norms um, pre the event. And uh, so we have, um, we have a, a six month window that we use to look at norms and they're, they're pretty stable. Um, they're, they're pretty stable in terms of the calibration of um, uh, sort of the messaging um, and the distribution of emotional expression at the aggregate across those eight categories that we measure. Um, so in that sense, we think what we're dealing with is a relatively stable system that mm. experiences a shock. Um, now, the question of norm emergence in the first place or sort of de novo is, I think, is a different, it's a different question that I, I, I honestly don't think we can answer with the data that we have since we don't have um, uh, mm. a long time horizon. I would speculate that an important sort of aspect of it, if you think of organizations and, and sort of local norm emergence is that uh, dual process of um, wanting to interact with each other, which you need in order to calibrate the norms, um, and seeing normative sort of um, uh, agreements which makes you inter wanna interact with the other party or continue interaction. Um, and so this is where we ended up with this idea of social solidarity, where you, you because you're a member of an organization, you're employed, you, you start interacting with other people by default, um, and, you know, and that drives the calibration process. If you had the freedom to leave and go as you wish, I think the norm convergence in that group would be harder because people could simply separate out into subgroups. So I think there needs to be some sort of vessel for you know, bringing people together in order for that process to kick in. But we can't observe it. Um, and by the way, the effect that we see in the changes is temporary. So after about four to six months, the, the, um, what we see with the withdrawal is, is sort of um, primarily going back to normal, except for a few people that actually left. Um. Last question is for Ajkasan, and it's actually a, a relevant question for... <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, how would you apply your findings to the world of academia? Given that conferences such as this one, oh. uh, <laughs> how do we achieve better uh, a really good question. in settings like this? Repeated interaction. Through <laughs> <laughs> repeated interaction. That's, That's why it's an <laughs> annual conference. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe keep in touch between conferences. <laughs> continue interacting, and um, in the models that I showed, we only have dyadic interaction, but there are network models of convergence which also indicate that the structure of the network makes an impact on whether you end up with a common convergent code or pockets of uh, subcultural codes. Um, so that clearly will have an impact, but generally the lesson is interaction across 
uh, sub-communities and um, repeated interaction and being committed to interact rather than yeah, leaving the interaction. Might matter, right? So. <laughs> right. So as Klaus said, um, you know, being committed to interact and have some communication matters a lot. And there is research which shows that successful communication makes people want to remain engaged mm -hmm. and keep interacting with each other. So um, I'm thinking that this conference is going to be great to spur further conversations and get people engaged with each other within and across subcultures. And we'll discover the kinds of clashes we might have if we do have that. So that is the perfect setup for what's coming next, which is a break, um, <laughs> during which we hope you get a chance to talk to one another. But please join me in thanking our four. Yeah. Yeah.